Hi everyone, really excited that you are joining for this edition of the Co-Management Commons podcast. And I'm really excited that Dr. Kerry Staples was able to join me from Whitehorse in the Yukon. And Kerry is somebody who literally grew up around co-management activities through her family and uh, later went on to study topics related to gender and co-management in her master's and then went on to study more in depth in the Yukon in the area of co-governance and has a lot of insights that's uh, important to be heard and in this podcast we'll talk more about her research but hoping that uh, the whole conversation around gender is something that can be continued because there hasn't been a lot of publications in the co-management literature about this topic since. So I hope you enjoy and we'll see you soon. Take care. Hi, Carrie. I'm really excited that we're doing this podcast. I know it's been a couple weeks in the making, but certainly nice to reconnect with you again. And I had no idea you were going to love podcasts so much. That was exciting to hear when I reached out to you. I do think that as I age, my love of podcasts is becoming my only personality trait. I think like I'm constantly mocked for the fact that I start maybe 50% of my sentences with, I was listening to a podcast the other day. <laughs> uh, but I, honestly, I go through phases. Right now, the main ones that I'm listening to are ones called Maintenance Bays. Would highly recommend. It's about health and wellness trends and debunking those. But I try and have a pretty diverse range of topics. I listen to maintenance phase partly educationally, but also because it's pretty funny. Yeah. And you obviously heard about this very obscure co-management podcast that got your interest. So that's really cool that we made the list and you've listened to a couple uh, episodes now. So yeah. Why don't you tell us a bit about who you are and your first introductions to co-management before we get into some more specific topics? Yeah, I guess my current introduction is that I am a consultant and, and facilitator based in Whitehorse on Kwanlin Dun and Tan Chan territories. And in terms of my relationship with co-management, I think it's been a real mix of academic and personal experience. So I grew up in Whitehorse and my dad was really involved in co-management. So he was the on a, a wildlife co-management board on the Inuvialuit Settlement Region, the North Slope Wildlife, wildlife Management Advisory Council. And so I think when I, as a kid, you have this vague sense of what your parents do. And so I had this vague understanding of what my dad did. I knew that he spent a lot of time in, in Nuvik and up in Herschel Island. And I had a vague sense of When we were kids, we went to a beluga uh, whaling camp and we had these kind of personal interactions with co-management, but also a bit bit of a distance from them as well. And so I had that kind of vague sense of co-management growing up. But then when I started my master's degree, I ended up with, as I think most grad students do, I ended up with a topic that there was funding for. And so I was handed this topic that ended up being about co-management. And so it was really, my supervisor had done this very preliminary work looking at the membership of different co-management boards, like across three territories. And one of the things that came out of that review is just that there weren't a lot of women on these boards. And so that became the impetus for my master's research and my introduction to more of the academic side of co-management. And it was really interesting kind of trajectory for me because I had this sense of co-management and I had I'd been to the some of the North Slope Wildlife Management Advisory Council conferences where you have all these people who are have been involved in co-management for a really long time who are really proud of the successes of co-management and are really doing some really interesting and innovative things and who are from Northern communities and who are real champions of co-management. And then when I started getting into the academic side of things, there was, at least at the time when I was doing my master's, 
this really big shift in terms of some of the academic articles that were coming out, really critiquing co-management. So is this really interesting shift for me in terms of coming to terms with my own connection to co-management, as well as starting to get into the academic world of co-management and some of the discussions within academia. That was a a little bit long-winded, but that's my background and my relationship to co-management. So your story uh, made me chuckle, actually, because it was literally just this morning, my 17-year-old son texted me and asked me what it was I do. And he wants to do an interview with me for some uh, class that he's in high school. Cool. And But first, he needed to figure out what is it exactly we do in <laughs> co-management. So when you said that, it really made me chuckle. And I can imagine being brought to the beluga harvest that must have left an impression on you at that time i would expect yeah i was pretty young but we do the, the photos are great to look back on i just look like this i look like a dirty child who has no pants and like a dirty doll and like a piece of bread in the other hand and it's just this you get this sense of it was a really cool opportunity and when you're a kid you just don't really question anything and those are the experiences that really make a great childhood. And I guess at the time you weren't familiar with the uh, Baby Beluga song by yes. Rafi? That's probably true. With the conference that you referenced, the North Slope Conference, tell me a bit more about that. I was able to attend one of the conferences and it was a really cool experience to see that many people involved in co-management from a really hands-on way, all in one room talking about why co-management is important to them. It was such a huge part of their relationship to the land. And I, yeah, and and again, I'll just come back to that, what I was saying earlier of this, it was at this really interesting time where I was like reading all these academic articles and then going to this, the WMET conference was just such a contrast. And I think both perspectives are important in different ways, but yeah, it was really important to me, I think, and just in terms of learning about the the connection that Northerners have, or many Northerners have, to co-management boards and how personal that connection is. I was interested to get back to your reference to your master's degree as well, because when I think I might have first said your name was in reference to a couple articles you published, and both of, it, both of them were on gender. And one was published in Arctic, the other one in Northern Review. And there's basically very few articles written since. So I, I'm not even sure if there have been any written since on this important topic about the lack of representation on co-management boards. And I often get asked about this at conferences, and I always point to your two papers as ones that people should read on this. And I really don't know if the needle has moved much in this past 10 years. I know in the co-management boards that I work with, there has now been women appointed, and I think we're now soon going to have our first female chair, but it was well over a decade before that progress started to happen. So your articles always resonated with me, and maybe you could just elaborate a bit more about that research that you did. We were talking earlier about how when you look back on what you've done, you're always like, I don't know if I would write that again, but that's okay. Um, Yeah, like you said, it was a a long time ago, so I've had to refresh myself on what I actually did and what I wrote. And it was funny because when I was looking back on my thesis, I did a bunch of interviews, which I love doing interviews. They're great. And that is a very fond memory of my master's. But I had totally forgotten that I had attempted a survey and it was just a wildly unsuccessful survey. (laughs) But so, yeah, that was what I did was mostly interviews with different folks, mostly women and a few men as well on co-management boards across the Yukon. So just for context, we have a number of different co-management boards in the Yukon. Most of the folks that I talked to were on renewable resource councils, as well as I think a chatted to a few folks who are kind of responsible for more territory-wide boards. So like the the Porcupine Caribou Management Board, which is a transboundary 
co-management board. So yeah, I, I chatted with folks across the Yukon essentially about their experiences on co-management boards. And what I was really interested in was looking at the experiences of women on co-management boards, as well as looking at the ways in which gender does or does not um, impact decision-making processes on those co-management boards. And so that was what I set out to do. I think that some a few of the things that came out of my research, some of which I still think are very valid, others which I think I would maybe write differently now. <laughs> Everybody but, would do that, probably. Yeah, yeah. I I worked. It's a bit of a tangent, but I worked with this brilliant woman named Tosh Southwick, and she, in some of the work we were doing, she was talking about reconciliation specifically. But she said something to the extent of, if you're looking back at what you thought was progressive five years earlier, you should probably be embarrassed about it. Otherwise, you're not moving. You're just you're if if you're not moving then what's the point? You should be embarrassed by what you, you thought was pro progressive. So that, that has always stuck with me. But yeah, some of the things that I talk about in my research, one of which was just highlighting the different experiences that men and women have on the land and why those different experiences are important to the context of co-management boards. I think that often it easy to focus on kind of the like the sexier side of co-management which is caribou and these like big animals which are obviously incredibly important and it's not that women aren't involved in those activities but some of which are still highly gendered <laughs> and so I was looking back at some of the quotes that I had in my master's and one of them I really appreciated was a woman was speaking about her experiences with traditional fish camps. And so maybe I can read you a quote if that's okay, because yeah, it's always it's better absolutely. to highlight other people's words rather than your own. Yeah, no, I'd love that. So she said, when you look at a traditional fish camp perspective, the majority of the work in my culture is done by women. And so we're the ones cutting fish, seeing the fish, doing all the work with them, hanging them, drying them, preparing them. Normally the men are catching the fish, but it's that type of involvement. And that's the perspective of what it's like to run a fish camp. And that's the perspective that I bring to the table. I'm paraphrasing her a little bit. But I think that obviously gendered roles are not set in stone, but they do exist in some cases. And I think that hearing the stories of different people's involvement on the land, and what they do on the land, their connection to the land, I think that at, at the very basic level, the research that I did highlighted the importance of those different experiences. It was there a particular interview or two that really sticks out in your mind that you remember of some people that you met that yeah. you still think about fondly? Yeah, I do. Yeah. There was the one I just mentioned. She talked about, and this was another kind of piece of the the kind of the research that I did was talking about decision making. And so I was looking at the difference between you can have the opportunity to influence decision making, but that can be different than whether your contributions actually inform decision making. And so I think that mo many of the women I talked to spoke about how opportunities to influence decision making are, are there. And so if you're a female board member, you have the opportunity, but that didn't always translate to actually feeling like your contributions were valued in the same way and that you could actually inform decision making. And this one woman who, uh, as quote I just referenced, she was an early on, an interview I did early on in my master's and she really framed things really well. And she talked about the how the, the if you're going to be taken seriously and if your contributions are going to be taken seriously, then you have to prove yourselves. And that ended up being a pretty consistent language that women, and in particular First Nations women that I spoke to, talked about using that language of having to prove yourself. And so this woman, she said, I'm going to paraphrase her, but she essentially said it wasn't until she had physically butchered a moose in front of her co-management colleagues that she felt like she was taken seriously, which is a, a great image. And so, yeah, I think I learned a lot in that interview. And yeah, and I think it really turned out to be a sign of some of the conversations that I was going to have going forward.
with different folks that I interviewed. And in the paper that you had in the Northern Review, there was reference to critical mass. That had a little bit to do with when there were more than one woman on a, on the boards. So was that the gist? Yeah. To... yeah. So that's essentially the idea that if you have to reach a certain number of, in this case, women on a co-management board for the participation of those women to be effective. So the idea being that if you have just one woman, it, it may not be easy for that woman to participate as effectively. And it's a pretty widely discussed concept, the idea of critical mass. And I think that what was interesting in the conversations that I had in talking about critical mass is that I was essentially talking to women about, do you think if there were more women on this board, would it be easier for you to participate? And it was a really mixed bag, actually, in terms of some women didn't think it would have any make any difference on in terms of informing their their participation. But what was interesting was that when you looked at the experiences of those women, the women who thought, oh, having more women on this board wouldn't affect me at all. Those women had typically only had experiences with a set number of women on their board. So they had, for example, there was, they had only ever been the one woman on their board, or there was actually one case where there was one, I think it was an RRC that actually was almost entirely women. And so oh, okay. a lot of those women thought that, oh, oh no, having more women on the board wouldn't change my experience at all, which is fair. But then when you contrast that to women who had had experiences with different numbers of women on a board, so they had been the only women but they had also been, they'd had a couple women on the board with them. And so women who had had different experiences with those different numbers represented on a board typically found that, oh, actually that does make a difference, which I thought was really interesting. And the other interesting thing about that is it's not just about the number, the number of women on the board. It's also about the positions that they hold. So one woman spoke about the importance of having a female chair, which you, you had mentioned earlier. and. In her experience, having a female chair really set the authority and set the tone for for the board. And she had found that made a huge difference in her experience. That's really interesting, too. When you're as a chair, you can really uh, set the tone and sometimes yeah. focus on different things that are important to different people. So I can see how that would be nice. And in one of the podcasts that we recently posted, with Dr. Dominique Henry, she had a really nice story in there about some interviews she recently did in Nunavut, and it was in the context of polar bears, but they really did a good job teasing out the gendered aspect of polar bear harvesting, mm -hmm. and they made a point to interview a lot of women and what their involvement was in, in this particular case with cleaning the hides and what they knew through that practice over time and stuff. And we've also recently did one interview with a female polar bear harvester who got her first bear. So that's also interesting too. So hopefully yeah. people will incorporate gender more so in all of the research they do. And hopefully more appointments will be made to these boards in this way. I could obviously see how there's, there would be a huge benefit. Yeah, one one of the women that I interviewed was she was a moose hunter, and that the year that I interviewed her, she had gotten the largest moose in the territory, and so you you get these like really cool stories from talking to folks, which is probably my favorite part of of research, to be honest. So one thing I was interested in chatting with you about is just reflecting on the things that I would do differently, okay. and obviously you are the podcast host, so I'm stealing the reins from you, but. I think okay, everyone then. would jump at the opportunity to revise what they previously wrote. It's it's a great opportunity. So if you don't mind. No, definitely. Tell me, right. what would you have done differently? Yeah. So one of the things that jumped out to me just in, in looking back at some of the things that I wrote is, again, one of the kind of a component of my research was about decision making. And I had talked with folks about essentially why it was important to have women represented on boards in the context of these decision making processes. And a lot of what people said, if there's women on the board there, it's a more holistic process. It's, there's less conflict. There's improved communication. 
And when I look back at that, those things can be true. But I do also see a lot of kind of ingrained stereotypes in some of those reflections. And so I think women are often socialized to not make a stink. And I think that can contribute to people's perspectives on why it's important to have women on those boards. These kind of set understandings of what gender means. And I think looking back, I would, I wish I would have explored that a bit more and under, tried to understand a bit more, explore a bit more where that came from. And then the other thing that came up was, again, just looking back on on what I had written, was what it means to be represented, to have your voice represented and the different forms that can take. And so one of the things that was brought up in one of the interviews that I did was a woman had explained, in this case, it was an Indigenous woman who was talking about how, in her experience, women in her community don't necessarily have to be directly represented on these boards because their voices are still represented, whether it's through their partners or their families who are on the board, their voices are represented through others. And they didn't necessarily have to, they didn't feel like they, like she had to be directly represented on those boards to feel that her voice was being represented. Uh And I wish I'd explored that a little bit more to, and leaned into it to understand there's tons of, of Indigenous women who are who write about kind of intersectionality so the different ways that we can look at these experiences and i was pretty narrowly focused on genders and i think that really limited me in the types of discussions that i was having and so looking back i wish i'd explored that a little bit more do you think that those kind of thoughts make it into your phd work when you transition there or did you have a bit more of an opportunity to more time, I'm sure, with your PhD to think of these things. I didn't carry on with the gender component into my PhD. I took a a broader look. and But I I do think that it did inform my perspective in that I think it encouraged me to really reflect a bit more on my own position as a researcher and the different layers that i bring to my research. I have a lot of different aspects to my identity and all of those different things inform my research in different ways. And so I do think that I I was introduced to this topic and it was a good first step given where I was. But again, I think it's always important to look back on and be a little bit embarrassed about what you thought was progressive. And I think I learned from it and tried to bring those lessons into my ongoing re- into my future research in different ways. As I was mentioning in the earlier part of our interview was really about discovering co-management through the relationships that my dad had established through his involvement on co-management boards. So he had built some relationships with some folks on a co-management board and we were very fortunate to have an opportunity to go up in the summer to one of their wheeling camps and I was pretty little, but it was, looking back on the photos at least, it's this really interesting reminder of those relationships. And I think that for a lot of folks on co-management boards, I'm obviously not speaking for everyone, but there are certainly opportunities for co-management boards to really build strong relationships. And I think that's something that is also starting to be reflected in academic world as well. My my master's supervisor, David Natcher, he wrote a piece on co-managing relationships and just the importance of relationships and how sometimes that can be lost in on certain co-management boards, but how that really should be the heart and soul of of a lot of these institutions. I really enjoyed that paper. I remember reading it and it really stuck in my head ever since because my impression when I first got involved in co-management was that all of our conversations would be about biology and animals and those sorts of topics. But after reading that article, I was like, no, this is spot on. This is way more about people and having good dialogue at meetings and trying to reach consensus and all of those fun things. And you mentioned your dad. So Carrie's dad is Lindsay Staples, who's recently retired from 
the co-management system in Whitehorse, but he had been working in the field for probably 30 years or more. So he has some early insights into how the whole system evolved in the Yukon. What an interesting point in time we are now, at least in the Yukon, of having these people who were part of land claim negotiations and who really envisioned this spirit and intent for co-management boards and had really high hopes for co-management boards. And now we're seeing the kids of those people on co-management boards. And I'm sure they see the limitations and the successes of, in terms of co-management boards, realizing the spirit and intent of, of the land claims and of these, these institutions that come from them as well. I was also mentioning in that conversation we had about, like a lot of us in the East look to what has been evolving in the Yukon for learning opportunities, given that uh, co-management has been set up there now ever since the 80s. And I really chuckle at your story about the reviewer that you had. And I think we should share that story about yeah, the paper yeah. you well, were writing. <laughs> Yeah, so it was during my master's degree, and I was trying to publish a paper. I can't remember which article or which uh, journal. And one of the reviewers came back with a comment that, well, the Yukon actually doesn't have co-management because they're advisory bodies. They're not decision-making bodies. And I think that in part, I understood where this the reviewer was coming from, which is that co-management, the term co-management is used in a lot of different ways. And so people can craft it to their dip to different situations. And that ended up being our, our response to the reviewer, which is essentially to say there is a whole spectrum of co-management boards. Different people mean different things when they talk, when they use that term co-management. And I think we had a pretty solid basis to say, well, actually, UConn does have co-management. And I, I'm sure we provided a definition that was well-established and, and whatnot. But whenever I talk to folks who are part, who were part of the land claim agreements and who are on co-management boards now, there is no question in my mind that, they're, that they are co-management boards. And I certainly they might be advisory bodies, but that I don't think that diminishes their their strength and the importance of them, at least as envisioned in the land claims agreements. And I think that, that comment also sparked some interesting thoughts for me in terms of thinking about the different types of power that co-management boards have. And this was something I was thinking about after our conversation. And I could be actually keen to hear your thoughts on whether there is a sort of I don't know if you'd call it soft power, but even if there these institutions are advisory, I think a lot of them have the potential to hold a lot of like social capital and have strength through that. And so that even if they are advisory, it would look really bad if a government were to, say, ignore the, the advice of that institution. So I'd be curious to hear from you. Do you see the management boards in the East? having any, some of that strength that is in the soft power, even if it's not explicitly making a final decision? Those conversations are definitely happening, happening with the co-management boards that I'm a part of. But personally, I don't like to dwell too much or talk about this whole idea of power. Like it feels mm -hmm. so either or, you either have it or you don't. And then there's the term soft power and it feels like we should be having an arm wrestle or something. And I, I get why people think about it in the sense it's a, a bit of an easy dichotomy. But one of the things I've noticed over the last 10, 15 years is that uh, ultimately we want our recommendations accepted by the minister when they're made. But there's so much process and research and dialogue and all these other things, research that co-management boards do along the way, that there's so many different points of influence and opportunities to change things that uh, may never make it to a minister's table to make a decision on. So 
I can point to a lot of really good success stories in the, the Nazi vote region that never had anything to do with a minister giving us permission to do it. So what can we actually do? And we don't actually need to ask anybody for permission. And it might yeah. actually improve the circumstances that we're in. Mm -hmm. So that's how I've tried to get my mind around it to stay motivated. Otherwise, it would get really deflating to simply look at the end result. I just don't feel it's overly practical when you come to work day to dwell yeah. on it and it doesn't really come into play. Yeah. And it's one of those things that it's easier to study those like concrete expressions of power, whether a decision is accepted or not, because those are trackable, those are quantitative. And the relationship stuff, the, the stuff you don't have to ask a minister for, the research, the everything else that co-management boards do, I think is a lot less visible to academics. And I think that really contributes to why power is such a huge part of the discussion. Um, within academia. And I don't want to crap on uh, academia since here you and I are sitting here with PhDs finished, but one of the motivations that I did have of kind of sharing some of the work that I have done was because a lot of what I was reading in academia didn't feel like it was from a practitioner perspective. And I'm hoping through this podcast that we can start to share more first-person narratives and stories from people that are at the board tables and in those co-management research projects and to actually mm -hmm. see what they've been experiencing, where there's frustrations, where there's a lot of pride. And I think it's a lot more nuanced than you're going to find in the academic articles. I'd love to hear your stories about the women you spoke to through interviews that were on co-management boards, what your experiences were. And yeah, why don't we, why don't we hear some of those? Yeah, certainly. Like I said earlier, I think interviewing is just probably my favorite part of research. And that was really a highlight of my master's was just hearing the stories from the women on co-management boards. and. I think the a couple of the things that stand out from those experiences, one of which was just the passion that co-management uh, members bring to the work that they do. I think that and this kind of comes back to the uh, the power piece a little bit in the sense that a lot of some folks were frustrated with maybe the the fact that they were just providing recommendations. And there was some frustration there, but I think a lot of people have a lot of passion for the possibilities of co-management. And I think co-management boards are really starting to push the envelope in terms of just what they're trying to accomplish and what they're doing. So are there any particular stories that stick out in your mind of women co-management board members that participated in the system? Like what, what was, what has their experience been like? One of the interviews that I did, what, the woman who I interviewed spoke to how, in her experience, she felt that she did not need to be directly represented on the co-management board for her voice to be represented. So whether it was through her family members, her community members, whoever that may be on the board, she felt that she had opportunities to influence, to shape that conversation and have her voice be represented through it in multiple avenues and she felt that she didn't necessarily need to be on the board and so that's something that i wish i had leaned into a little bit more and and explored a bit more to better understand the differences between direct representation and other opportunities to have your voices heard i was reflecting on that a little bit and it was it just felt so counterintuitive and i wonder if that's a minority perspective or if more women would still prefer to definitely have a seat at the table and express their perspectives firsthand. I, I found it really interesting, like thinking about it that way. I think it speaks to like the different ways that people relate to their identity. And so yeah. 
and again, this is something that I wish I had brought. And I think I certainly learned a lot about as I was doing this research is this idea of intersectionality and having different connections to different aspects of your identity. And I think that lens could have brought a lot more to my research and to better understand gender is actually not the only way that that people relate to the world around them. And I think that really influenced how I did my PhD research, trying to bring a more nuanced understanding to myself as a researcher and to the work that I do and kind of the lens that that, that a little bit more of an intersectional lens that I can bring to my own work. Why don't we fast forward a bit then to talk about when you started to research a little bit more about the idea of co-governance. I'm, I'm really interested to talk to more people about the difference between co-governance and co-management and are they really just interchangeable? Or I'd love to hear more about that part of your research career. Yeah, so I, I think after doing my master's degree, talking about co-management, I think in that, many, that in many ways transferred or was the impetus for me to start looking at co-governance. And part of that was about the more limited decision-making that co-management boards can have. And I was interested in exploring essentially other models of governance. And the way that I did that was through the lens of cumulative effects. And so I was looking at the, in, in the Yukon, I was looking specifically at the Yukon and the different approaches to addressing cumulative effects and the extent to which those processes were meeting expectations for co-governance. I think that at the, at the end of the day, there are a lot of similarities, I think, into in the way that those terms are used. Co-management, as I said, is such a spectrum in terms of how people use it. And I think co-governance can in many ways be the same. There's a really big spectrum in terms of what people are referring to when they talk to co about co-governance. And I was looking specifically at co-governance through land claim agreements. And again, the processes that I was talking about such as regional land use planning, where you have affected First Nations that are decision makers on the regional land use plan. I think in many ways, the conversation about co-management was also a conversation, a similar conversation about co-governance. There are limits to that decision making authority. There are limits to the process. But there is also this really powerful spirit and intent for those processes that is laid out in the in the land claim agreements. And so I think I started at this place of being, of thinking like, oh, my master's degree was out about this one thing. I'm going to really push the, my own understanding and my own boundaries to think about this new thing. And my learning about these things ended up being fairly similar. Like what cumulative effects, can you just put that into context for me so I can conceptualize that a little bit better because you talked about co-governance in that context, but uh, what are we referring to there exactly? Yeah. Cumulative effects is one of those terms where it's like a complex term, but it actually, I think, reflects how most people experience the world. So it just speaks to the combined past, present, and future impacts on something. I've heard a, a really helpful metaphor talking about if you wake up tired one day and you think, okay, why am I tired? Is it that I went to bed really late last night? Or it could be the past two weeks, I've been really stressed at work. That's probably not helpful. Could be that I'm my, in my case, personally, my toddler has been teething <laughs> and I've had some good sleeps, but some bad sleeps. Point being that all of these things have probably combined to impact your current state of tiredness. And that's all we're talking about when we're talking about cumulative effects is what is the combination of these different pressures on something? I know I've read like a little bit of, about the origins of the land claim agreements in the Yukon and different industrial developments that led to negotiations and there was the Burger Inquiry and so on. I'm just curious, are there anything happening right now in the Yukon that are pressing and might be like the latest cumulative effect or pressure on co-governance or co-management? I'm just not as up on the current developments and politics and, and all of those sorts of things. What's your sense of 
things right now in this field? It's certainly a hot topic and people love talking about it, but cumulative effects are on a lot of people's minds right now. I think in the Yukon, the types of cumulative effects or in types of pressures associated with cumulative effects that we tend to talk about the most here are probably related to climate change and mining. I say that with the experience of I have talked about cumulative effects in mining before and really had some people who had some strong concerns about the implication that mining could have cumulative effects. But I think in terms of what people are talking about, those are the big ones. Just simply in terms of the footprint of mining in the Yukon, it's one of the biggest sources of pressure and especially combined with climate change. So those are the two main areas of, I think, of cumulative effects conversations. I think there's also a lot of folks talking about cumulative effects in the context of certain species. So Caribou is a huge one. And I think there's a lot of co-management boards in particular, actually, that are doing really cool work to try and address cumulative effects to Caribou. And so there's, and this tying back to co-management boards, they're doing really cool things in that sense. There's a lot of focus on or conversation around how cumulative effects are brought into assessment processes, impact assessment processes. We have our own impact assessment legislation here that stems from the umbrella final agreement. And that has its pros and cons, I think, especially in the context of cumulative effects. But I think in the Yukon, at least that's where the conversation is at around cumulative effects is what are some of the processes that we have in our agreements to deal with them? What are some of the co-management boards doing about them? What are other processes that we have at our disposal that we can use outside of the agreements and so on? You were hinting at some difficult conversations and I was like speculating, was this somebody that might have had a point of view that mining was not going to have a cumulative effect? Yeah, I guess I can tell you the story, even though it's slightly traumatic. I was, it wasn't traumatic. I, I fully laugh about it now. I think I, I'm a sensitive soul, <laughs> perhaps too sensitive for, yeah, for this world. But I was doing a presentation on cumulative effects in my research, and it was a very high level conversation. I was just talking about this is cumulative effects. And if you're talking, if you're thinking about cumulative effects, here are some of the ways you, sh you can think about them. And like really high level stuff. But I was bringing in examples from my PhD work. And I used an example from one of the, the interviews that I did. Someone spoke to how a lot of folks in a certain area that was heavily mined, they don't want to go hunt there for moose because it, it's gross. <laughs> Right. And moose that have been hanging out in areas that have been mined. And my broader point was that people don't make decisions just based on numbers. It, there's also a per perception involved. So even if you have, you have a ton of testing that says, yes, that moose is safe to eat, you're probably still not going to hunt there if you have other options. And that was my only point was that it's not just people don't make decisions based solely on on numbers. And anyways, I was told that I was similar to an anti-vaxxer because that's not science. That's coffee shop tongue. And anyways, there was a, like a very long diatribe about how miners are doing everything they can to, which I'm sure in some cases is true. I do get that must be frustrating to be in an industry where you feel like you're being blamed for everything. I get that. That's fair. But I do think that my broader point was perhaps missed. And now we like to, in my household, we like to joke about how social science is not science, just coffee shop talk. Oh, no. Uh, I got to remember that quote. But no, no. I, I definitely can resonate with the sentiment. And when you get into these discussions about whether or not social science is science, but it's definitely way more than coffee shop talk. Let's set the record straight on that for yeah. sure. <laughs> is there a particular mine under development there now? Or there's a lot of proposed, proposed new mines? To. Yeah, there's the Victoria Gold Mine, is probably our biggest one. And then there's a couple that one of the mines being proposed would have the largest tailing dams in the world. Oh, so we okay. have a lot of really big activity going on, especially in kind of central Yukon 
So it's a really interesting time to talk about cumulative effects, to be honest, and to contemplate what that will look like in the future and to think about the processes that we have now for dealing with them and the limitations of those processes. It, yeah, it's like I said, it's a hot topic right now. And with that particular mind, whose lands is it? There's a couple of different, different mines being proposed. In the area of Nacho de Acton territory, Selkirk First Nation, the southern part of Tronicwichin territory is a huge, has a ton of mining in it and has for a really long time. Placer mining in particular, but also the coffee gold mine. I believe it, there's a couple mines in White River First Nations asserted territory. Little Salmon Carmax, as I think is, is implicated by it. There's all this, really that whole swath of, of central Yukon, whether it's the actual mine itself or it's downstream effects or it impacts associated with roads being developed or increased pressures on existing roads, so on and so forth. That yeah, and, uh, of, and of yeah. course, all of that development wouldn't have any cumulative effect on the other topic that you mentioned is a hot topic of climate change. Yeah. Uh, I'm really interested to just talk about that a little bit more as well, because we're, we're seeing firsthand in Labrador what climate change is looking like. And I'm just curious, what does that look like? for people in White Horse and throughout the Yukon? Like, what are people noticing differently there now? Yeah, I think that this, the past couple of years have been a really good example of that. So I think two years ago and then three years ago, we had crazy floods that were pretty unprecedented. Last year, we had um, quite a few wildfires. Nothing is certainly as bad as Yellowknife or the Northwest Territories. But yeah, there's a lot of realities that are setting in when our systems just aren't really well set up to to deal with them. Just looking at wildfires, like the our wildfire crews, they're year end at a certain time in the year. And because of climate change, the actual fire season when fire risks is high is now extending beyond when we have fire crews. And, and so there's all these, our systems aren't keeping pace with climate change. And you can extend that, I think, to any of the other impacts that we are associated with climate change. There's obviously impacts to wildlife are a huge part of this conversation. A lot of folks, salmon, the salmon runs have been pretty abysmal. There's quite a few First Nations who do voluntary uh, moratoriums, essentially, on salmon fishing, which is huge, a huge impact. Yeah, the, it, there's a lot of, it's just a lot of uncertainty, I think, and that is really scary for a lot of folks. I find that it's a hard one to get our mind around in the context of a co-management board because so many of the species that we care about are obviously affected by climate change. But I don't know what the answers are necessarily at times at our level of influence. I know sometimes there's governments who will want to impose limitations on the indigenous people, but they're not really addressing their real issue of climate change. They're just basically impacting local people's ability to adapt and so on. And I really struggle with climate change in the context of our co-management discussions and trying to figure out, okay, what should be we be recommending? And is it as simple as reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Is that something that we should be spending a lot more of our research time on understanding climate change so we can make uh, climate science recommendations? I'm really trying to get my mind around it because otherwise I don't feel like we're actually addressing what the main threat is to the animals that we care about. But it's really heartening to hear of examples of where a voluntary moratorium would be put in place for a salmon run, for example. I think those situations, when they emerge, should really be highlighted because they're an example of local people just taking things in their, into their own hands at that point to try their best to have a sustainable resource. I think this was a, a great chat, Carrie, and hopefully our paths will cross again in the future and probably we'll be in Whitehorse at some point sometime soon. Perfect. Thanks, Jamie. You didn't have any deep thoughts to end this podcast on, did you, to really make us reflect or ponder in our sleep about co-management? 
sadly, no. Deep thoughts are beyond me on the best of days. Oh, I hear you. And good luck with the teething. I can't imagine that's easy. And please pass along another hi to Lindsay for us and look forward to chatting with him soon. On the podcast. On the podcast. On the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. All right. You take care.